Good evening, everyone. My name is Linda Key Jackson, and I am the CEO of the Fragrance Foundation UK. We are delighted that so many of you have joined us tonight from all over the world for our, our evening with event. We are absolutely thrilled to welcome the talented Aurelien Guichard, born and raised in grass, the centre of the perfume universe. Aurelien had an early introduction to fragrance through the family business, involved in growing roses and jasmine used by the major perfumers. His father, Jean Guichard, was already an acclaimed perfumer himself. Our host this evening is Annalise Fard, who is the chairperson of the Fragrance Foundation UK and the director of Beauty, Home, Fine Fragrance, sorry, Fine Jewelry and Watches at Harrods. I cannot actually think of a more dedicated and dynamic duo to spend the next hour with. <laughs> Thank you so much for the kind words, but I can only reiterate, Orion, how excited we are to be speaking to you this evening. So thank you so much for joining us. Um, Linda's already touched on, just in her intro a little bit, that I believe you're the seventh generation of a family of growers and perfumers. Is that correct? Yes, that's, that's correct. Good. Unbelievable. However, I also believe that perfumery wasn't necessarily something initially you were keen to get into or expected to. And actually, you started your studies, at least, in England, in Bristol. Yes, I did. And what did you study? Uh, I studied uh, economics, actually, which was had nothing to do with, uh, with perfumery. But uh, in fact, uh, as I grew up, I never really wanted a, to be a perfumer. My, my father uh, was a perfumer, my grandfather and my old family was working in the, in the perfume business and my mother was a sculptress. And one of the main things they always taught me is one of the most beautiful thing is to work with people around the world from abroad. And, and I, from an early age, I, I had the desire to leave France and, and to go and, and meet uh, other people, other culture. And I was very fond of England. So I studied, uh, I studied in Bristol. Amazing. And yeah, do you still have a passion for England? I, I, I do. I mean, I have many friends, uh, obviously, that, that, that live there. We also have actually a, a cottage in the West Hebrides in North Scotland. Uh, there's a, a little island nearby Harris and Lewis Island. Uh, it's a little island called Scalpe, and uh, it's a, a unique place, and it's a deserted place where there's, you know, few people living there, but uh, with very strong personality, with a great uh, sense of hospitality, and a great way of living, and close to nature, and it's, that's also has been a very inspiring place wow. uh, in my life. Wow, I didn't know that. So you're closer to us than we even think, for sure. <laughs> you mentioned your passion for people and different cultures. And, and I guess that must have influenced your perfumery over many years, right? It did. Uh, I've always seen perfumery as an act of sharing. And when actually a perfumer creates, of course, he creates with his own test with what he likes, with what he finds beautiful, but more importantly, he creates for other people. And you know, my I, I don't see uh, um, creating fragrance as something incredibly unique. I, I, I think there are many people who could be perfumers. Uh, it's only a mean of meeting other people who want to work with you. And the goal is to be understood and to create to create fragrances that are clear to be appreciated by experts and non-experts. Yeah, amazing. I, um, I think you're maybe doing it a little injustice to say that many people could be perfumers. <laughs> We're not so sure about that. Um, but I'd like to think we all in our hearts have a little bit of something um, where we, we go and we find memories that we'd like to recreate or be inspired from things. But you're, we, Linda mentioned your father as well, who started, I believe, as a grower, but then became a perfumer. Um, and tell me, how much did he influence you? Well, you know, in many ways, uh, when it comes to creation, it's more, you know, I don't think anyone can tell you what to do, but someone can influence you on how to do it. Yeah. And how, you know, what kind of ethic you have and you put behind your work. Uh, how do you how do you work and what are the values you put behind be, be behind your work 
And so that's one thing that some, somehow doesn't lie behind words, but more lies behind a way of doing things. Uh, the other thing is, I think, you know, a, a sense of love for raw materials. Mm -hmm. uh, this is really something that drove uh, really much my love for this work is, you know, I grew up with parents and grandparents who were actually growing roses and jasmine and verbena in the south of France. Mm -hmm. So my access to actually to perfumery uh, from an early age was from was through raw materials more than through creation itself. And how long has how long have the um, uh, the farms been in your family for many years? Many years. Uh, you, you know, in fact, when you look at uh, the region of Grasse, uh, that is well known for uh, perfumery, of course, people were actually growing uh, ingredients, whether it's rose, jasmine, verbena, on top of their own work. So, you know, it's funny to say, but, you know, our days, a lot of people do that as a, as a, as a job and as a work and in a very uh, professional way. At the time, I think even 50 years ago, many people had a men work. And on top of that, they were actually growing and, and growing um, roses, jasmine, verbena, mm -hmm. you know, and, and so on. Just so, like a side business, a side hustle, as I would call exactly, it. Exactly, exactly. Amazing. And, I, and you still have the farm, that's right. We still do, but on top of that, uh, I actually opened another farm uh, six years ago in the region of Grasse, where uh, I decided as my grandparents were getting older, where I wanted to, to make my own farm uh, with the help and contribution, of course, of my family, but you know, with the goal to actually create my own ingredients that I wouldn't sell, that I would strictly use for my own creations, and growing them organically was also something very important to me. Yeah. But so it was very much something linked with preserving a know-how, but also, you know, having the chance to be able to share something with, on one hand, people from my family and to actually share a passion and to carry on doing that together and also to work with local people uh, you know, we, because it's also very inspiring. I mean, you know, when an idea comes in my mind to create a perfume, quite often it comes from observing, observing people and sometimes observing people who work with nature. Yeah, amazing. I didn't know that you solely use those, those ingredients. Nobody, you don't sell them at all. They're all just for your creations, as you say. That's exactly. And, and, and I'm, you know, it's like a dream come true when I started this, because, you know, at the time when I started my, my rose farm, I wasn't planning on creating Matière Première, my fragrance house. I was just planning on trying to be the only perfumer in the world to produce and use for its fragrances its own raw materials. Yeah, incredible. Well, we're gonna come, I'd love to hear a little bit more about that creative process in a moment because it fascinates us. But another thing that I'd love you to give us some insight, and I'm sure certainly for me, perfumery schools generally have this sense of intrigue and actually mystery about them. I'm sure many people feel the same. Um, and, I do, and I know you trained at the Juvedan Perfumery School. Tell us a little bit what, what was that like? For me, it's these like heady corridors of scents coming out of secret rooms, um, but maybe it's not quite so mystical as that. <laughs> I don't know if it's that mystical, but it is indeed magical. Uh, <laughs> when, I, when I learned perfumery, um, it was after university. I graduated from university and I was offered to join the Givaudan Perfumery School. Um, one of the key things that actually, uh, you know, that resonates to people who employed me was the fact that I was, I think, an open-minded person and I was very happy to meet and understand different cultures. And this sense of open-mindedness, I think is key when you want to become a perfumer. And I was lucky enough to have people who, trust, who, who trusted me. But when I first started the school, there was, you know, and it's one of the best schools in the world. I have wonderful memories with the students, with Givaudan, with the people who actually taught me. But the, the, the teaching itself, it's, it's very academic. There's nothing really creative about it. 
So yeah. some people may think it's a lot about being creative, but you, in fact, the training lasts for three years and you strictly and only learn. You learn by heart, just like if you would go to a, to a, to a music school or to the bazaar, where you learn your techniques, you learn the raw materials by heart, and you learn them almost like a language. And I remember those days when I was learning the, the ingredients, it was really much like learning a different language. You know, when you learn, you know, and you forget, and you learn again, and you forget again, and you learn again. And after a while, the ingredients and the words are part of you, and you use them very commonly and frequently. Yeah, and this, so the, the, this, this process is long. This process is, you know, you, people who go through the, the Givaudan Perfumery School um, got tests almost every day. Uh, on the raw materials and they need to know them by heart and it's so it's a very serious and very I would say not so creative teaching it's more about learning the technique to be fluent enough to master them and to be free on the day that you want to start creating things yeah. I've never heard it described like that it's fascinating and it makes a lot of sense to be honest with you for sure and um, I so tell me, I, you know, when, when we also speak with such renowned perfumers as yourself, I think the one thing we also love to hear from you and understand is what, what, it, what, it, what is your creative process? How do you take an idea, a thought, a, a moment, and then finally create something that we can all enjoy at the end of it? I think the amazing thing is that there's probably as many creative processes as there are perfumers. And, 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 and I think also the teaching method, I mean, many perfumers have different, uh, have learned how to become a perfumer differently. So there's not just one way of creating, nor there's one way of learning how to create perfumes. Um, my creative process is, you know, I, I have two ways of working. You know, a part of my work is working for different fashion house. So mm -hmm. I create for, and I create fragrances for brands that, most of you would know. And I am really working at the service of those houses. So I usually receive, you know, I would say more commonly a project, a brief, and my creative process is usually to try to figure out what person would the best embody and represents the projects. Okay. So it can be someone I know, it can be someone I see in the street, it can be someone famous that I think of, but it usually lies into an attitude, a way of doing things, a way of talking. And I would say, okay, this person will represent, my, will represent my idea. And probably just like a writer, I will try to use certain ingredients, just like a writer uses words to express this idea. And, and you know, that is one of the most interesting process is how do you translate an idea into smells and that really differs from the project and in my mind will resonate the smell and i will try to write down on a usually on a on a formula on a paper i will write down you know my formula in a very simple way and and see what what it smells like so that's one way of creating and the other way of creating is when i create for matière première which is differently okay. because then i'm at the service of a raw material so I will look at a raw material and tell myself, okay, how does it, what facet of it can I exploit? What, how can I make it shine for people? Amazing. And we're going to come on and talk a bit more about Mathieu Premier because clearly, you know, I have an invested interest being here in Harrods today. And um, it's, it's, a, it's a brand and, and a house that we're very close to for sure. Um, I, mean, I have one question here from one of our guests this evening or one of, or one of the guys joining us and it's from Nicola. And she actually asked, when we talk about creative process, she actually asked, where is the most unexpected or strangest place you found a spark or inspiration for a fragrance from? Well, I often find, I often find the spark of an inspiration from the people that I received the brief from. Uh, and it means that it doesn't really lies into words or into the project itself, but it lies into the way they are, how crazy they are, how inspiring they can be, how creative they are, in what way do they move, in what way do they talk. 
And, and this is, I think, so interesting because when you create a fragrance, of course, you know, if I, I give an example, if I create a patchouli for a brand and I create another patchouli for another brand, I won't write the story in the same way because mm -hmm. the way my formula is written has to reflect a certain style. If I work for a designer or for a couturier who is all about details, who is all about, uh, you know, little, little details and is like perfectly fine and, and, and it's all about little things, my formula would be about that because it had to reflect this style. It was the case, for example, when I worked for John Galliano. At the opposite, if I worked for Giorgio Armani, who likes more slick and, and is like originally an architect and angle and sharp lines, the formula has to reflect this style. And, 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 you know, so that's, I think, one element of answer. And then the brief itself can be very different. You know, I worked many years for uh, Monsieur Issey Miyake. And Monsieur Issey Miyake one day, for example, sent me a pen ticket in Paris. And he said, you know, I invite you for, for spending five days in, in an island in Japan. Wow. Spend five days and come back in Paris and make a fragrance that reflects this place. And, and so this is also so crazy and inspirational because it's not a matter of, of being in a competition. It's just a, a matter of trust of someone who wants you to experience something so that you create a fragrance from. Amazing. So it literally could be multifaceted in all different places. Exactly. Yeah. And, and how do you, how, what, how do you go about it? So when, you, what, like I said, when, because I'm sure there are times when you just receive a brief, a piece of paper, right? And is that then when you revert to trying to understand who this person is who's behind the creation? There's, um, you know, our days really you get it through paper. It's true, you get it uh, mainly through, through presentations, but okay. usually you meet the people. Uh, mm -hmm. If I don't meet the designer in the first place, then I will spend time. And that's a very important point. I will spend time going to the different stores where his work is, where people buy his clothes, because I will try to really understand what people are looking for when they go and buy his work. Um, I will, of, all, of course, you know, make a work of documentation to understand the past of the brand, the roots of it. And so I get all this information. And from there on, I try to find an interesting story to, 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 to tell and an in interesting smell to, to create. Lovely. But if you don't get an idea, a good idea, then usually it doesn't work. You know, you need to find something that has some, some interest so that the fragrance smells different. I think a lot of people our days, I would say complain or say, you know, fragrance, a lot of them smell the same. So you need to have a strong idea at first so that the result at the end is unique. Yeah, exactly. It almost has that, yeah, that little something. I all noted, if I ever want to create a fragrance, I know I have to make sure that I pitch well. <laughs> I share a little bit of, of ourselves and what I'm trying to create. It's very exactly. important by the sounds of it. This is so important, you know, because I don't create fragrance by myself and I, don't, I wouldn't be able to create alone. It's, it's something that surprises a lot of my friends when I say that. But really, when I create a fragrance, I create hand in hand with the people that I work with. Amazing. And quite often I've tried to create fragrance alone just for me to, and it, it doesn't really make sense to me. You know, it's again, it's all about a creative process that you share with other people. And, and what, one of the most beautiful thing of my work and, and, and of being a perfumer is to be part of some incredibly talented people universe. And, and to be, you know, even it's something, you know, that from the first day that I started creating for people, it's really something that really, to me, moved, moved me very much is, you know, how amazing is it to work for great brands, for great designers, for people who, who have such a talent that they actually effectively think, think my work is interesting. What a joy that it's so collaborative. Um, Carl, one of our one of um, one of our members who's joined us today, Carl, is asking. Um, he'd love to know um, what that process, I guess, was like when you created the fragrance with Corinne Rodfield. How how was that? 
Ah, it was a great memory. You know, we say usually that great fragrances come from great encounters. Mm -hmm. And and I created a few for, for Karine uh, Rothfeld. And, but it's a, it was a lot about talking to Karine, you know, making, you know, understand who she was. And, and Karine was extremely, she really opened her heart. She talked about some very private and personal memories, things that she liked. And, and then, you know, it's, you get all those, those elements together and you come up with a first draft, a first creation, and you see if the person thinks it's interesting. And then hand in hand with her, we make modification to fine tune and make the, the fragrance perfect. And this, those are two different steps. One step is about knowing the person, spending time with, with, with her, spending time with Karen, understanding you know, what kind of woman she was on top of the image we have. Exactly. And I guess that's the key, right? Yes. And, and then if, you, if this part goes well and there's a, a good alchemy like we, like we did have, then there's a second part of the work is to fine tune together, you know, to get the idea right, to, to, to make sure the fragrance diffuses well, to make sure the idea is sharp enough, the idea is refined enough, and fits perfectly the person you created for. And, and Karin was extremely involved uh, in the process. Yeah, amazing. Aurelian, we, we clearly are in awe of your success, but we'd love you to know, why do you think you've been so successful in your career? <laughs> I, I think I was lucky uh, to meet the right people who, who trusted uh, my work. Mm -hmm. I was very lucky. Uh, to, to meet some people, you know, when you're 23, 24 years old and you first start uh, your first project, I was very lucky because I actually, in the first years that I started my career, I made a fragrance for Guerlain, went for Nina Ricci, and I was lucky enough to meet people who were brave enough to ask a young guy to create a fragrance for them. And, and they could have asked more renowned perfumers. Mm -hmm. And it's something I will never forget. And, you know, again, Karine is the same. When I worked with Karine Watfeld, you know, she actually chose to work with me. She could, you know, of course, everybody wanted to work with Karine. But, you know, so this is very much, I think, at the heart of my, of, of you know, what you may think it's a success, but, you know, what drive and what makes my, my work actually absolutely incredible is the fact that I'm lucky enough to work with very talented people. And, and really, because it, it really, I think, set, the, the, set a certain level of expectation and it makes just the work much more fascinating when you work with people who have an amazing universe. I'm sure they feel equally lucky to work with you. Um, who has influenced you over the years in your career? Many people. Uh, and, and, you know, I say, uh, you know, I we started, we spoke about my family background. I have a mother, she's a sculptress. Uh, she sculpt marble. Uh, she, had, she really influenced me very much in the fact that everything is possible when you put all your art into it. And, and, and then you meet people who will maybe feel your, what you do is special. Um, I would say the different perfumers, friends that I've, that I've become friends, that I've worked with. And there are many different ones. You know, I don't have one perfumer that to me is a, an amazing mentor. I have plenty of people that I, I saw to are, are incredibly talented perfumers that I worked with at Givaudan, Firminich, and today at Takazako. Yeah. And I would say very importantly, as I said before, my, what we say as perfumers, my clients, you know, my, my, the people that actually um, trust me to create their fragrance. I think that really are... Are, they are very inspirational for two reasons, for their test, of course, but also because quite often they are entrepreneur. And I think, you know, creating is also, uh, creating a company is also a, an act of creation. Uh, being an entrepreneur is very creative. Mm -hmm. And I think you need a certain, you need to be brave in a way, and they are, all of them are, to, to have made success. And that's inspiring because you feel like, you know, oh, you know, I wish one day I could, I could do that as well. Yeah. <laughs> you know? And I'm sure you mentor young yourself now, young perfumers. 
Yes, but I try to mentor young perfumer as I was mentored. I was mentored by, by two perfumers mainly, Olivier Pecheux, who works at Givaudan, and Nathalie Chetto, who also works at, uh, at Givaudan. And uh, both I of them- I mean, they're them, great names. Uh, <laughs> yes, they are great <laughs> names. Great are, but more than great names and great perfumers, they're great, great people. And, and I think, you know, I was lucky because they really told me from day one, do, the, do things the way you want to, 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 to do them. You know, if you need us, ask us. And my father was the same. Mm -hmm. There are people who mentor you by giving you confidence more than, mm -hmm. you know, putting their name on, on, on your formula. Yeah, very <laughs> and, true. And, I, and, and in a way, I, I try to, I, I would say, if I hope to be a good mentor one day. It's, it would be in that respect. You know, I think young perfumers are quite often very capable of doing amazing things. For sure. And Izzy is asking, what would be your one bit of advice you would give to an aspiring perfumer? Um, I would say that I would, I would give two advice. The first one is to be happy and because happiness drives positivity and drives courage. And you need to be, you, you need to do things without thinking about the consequences. Are you gonna win? Are you gonna lose? You need to just do your ideas and to be confident in your ideas. That's one thing. And the second thing is something I've heard recently that I thought was a great idea um, by one of the ex uh, boss of Shiseido. He was telling me that a good advice is often, if you start in a company, you need to find someone you admire. And you need to try to make sure you get close to him, that you try to help. You know, when I started my career, I was making coffee and I was doing everything no one wanted to do. And make yourself appreciated. And if this person recognizes you and wants to help you, then that's that's a great start. Yeah. You know, and if Fabulous. there's no one and if there's no one you admire in a company, then you should change company. It's the wrong young. company. <laughs> that's, a I, that's a fantastic piece of advice that I think we could put into many situations, right? For sure. I've touched on it already, but we, I mean, we were thoroughly delighted here at Harrods to launch Betier Premier. So thank you, firstly, for that. Um, but this year, we were even more lucky that you created an exclusive fragrance for us, Oud 7. I have it here. I have my show and tell on my desk. Um, I've literally, my room is now, has the most fabulous scent in it um, because I've just sprayed it. But can you tell everybody about your inspiration for this particular fragrance? So Wood 7 at Matière Première, we, has, we have one goal when we create and when I create a perfume is to show the beautiful facet of one main raw material. And we build the fragrance around this overdose of raw material. So, you know, the creative process relies very much into sourcing. So in order to start, sourcing is an act of creation. You know, when you're a perfumer, writing one line has, one, has a meaning. So, you know, oods, there are plenty of oods around the world. So it took a lot of time for me to select what I thought was a perfect oud, uh, the oud that I was going to overdose. And this oud is a oud Hassan. It's uh, originally from Bangladesh. Mm -hmm. uh, it's a, we feel a wonderful oud because of course olfactively it's absolutely incredible but on top of that it's a oud that is developed uh, with the help of local population so there's a real social uh, contribution in the fact that we buy this oud and it's also part of an ecological plan to preserve the forest and so whenever one you know the oud you get it by cutting a tree that actually had a, um, an infection and this infection smells good. Wow. So whenever they cut a tree, it's a company called Jalali. Whenever they cut a tree, they replant 20 Amazing, trees. amazing. So th this is really at the heart of Matière Première. Whenever we start a creation, whenever I start a creation, I pay a particular attention at the selection of our ingredients that we will overdose. And the other reason why we want to overdose an ingredient is also to assure that the suppliers and the producers will have enough orders for the coming for the years to come. 
So it's not a matter of putting a drop of one, one raw material. We put a large quantity of it for this purpose. And it's called Oud 7 because, you know, Ouds have little cousins ingredients. And I've, I, because I've used a large quantity of Oud, I have wanted to make a creation where I refine this Oud. By refining it, I combine it with seven ingredients that are typical of, a, of that are typical mm -hmm. and that link very well with the oud. Patchouli, oil from Indonesia, cypriol oil from India, sandalwood oil from Australia, cistus labdanum. Uh, we also have um, a touch of, uh, we, we have also, you know, I can't have them all in my mind, but so we have seven ingredients. Uh, uh, Gayak wood from Paraguay. Uh -huh. And on top of those seven ingredients, the work was just to amplify and to wrap the wood in two leaves, violet leaves, because it has something, you know, dark. Uh, you know, the violet leaves, they, they actually grow in the shadow, in the shade of the forest, just like where the, you know, in the same way that a, that a wood tree will, will grow. And it's also wrapped with another leaf, tobacco leaf, tobacco leaf absolute from Balkan. And the idea is really to get an extraordinary rich wood wrapped with those leaves, Beautiful. leaves of tobacco, leaves of violet. And again, yeah. the idea is to create a perfume, a perfume that is understandable. We want the perfume at Matière Première to be extremely diffusive, extremely powerful, long lasting, but they, need, they also must be understandable when someone smells it. They mm -hmm. must see the different ingredients, that is key. It's exquisite. So thank you very much um, for sure. Somebody um, on, on our group here tonight asked, what, do, you, uh, do you recall your first ever visit to Harrods? Yes. I promise I yeah, never yes. asked that question. I promise. <laughs> no, 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 no. I, I, I do. But in, in fact, uh, I, had I had three different visits that were very, that I remember of. The first visit is when I was a little kid. And, uh, and my, my parents took me to Harrods. You know, they were very close to, they were very close to London and they lived in, my parents lived in London. Actually, when my mother started her career, she was actually making decoration in the windows of Harrods. As a, she was employed at Harrods. Yes, oh she goodness. was a student. She that. Was, she, uh, that was in I the should, 70s. I should check her name in our archives for you. Yes. Incredible archives here. So she worked for, for I think, uh, a month or, or two and when she first arrived in England. So I went to Arras when I was a young kid. Then I went the first time, uh, I went uh, with uh, Robert Piguet, the, the fragrance brand. Yeah. And I, I got to meet this amazing, you know, fragrance hall. You know, uh, and to me, I was amazed because at the time I, I wasn't so conscious uh, about the fact that there was such a place in the world that was actually selling fragrances, niche fragrances, and that there was su such a demand. And that must have been, I think, around 2005, 2006. Okay. And, uh, and then the, I would say the third time is when I came to Arads to present Matière Première. That was before actually Matière Première got launched. We launched Matière Première in October 2019. That's and the right. first place we, we launched Matière Première was at Arads. And before launching Matière Première, I remember coming with my two associates to meet uh, Vesa Kello <laughs> and to meet uh, you know, people from Arads and to, yeah. I showed them the project. And right from the beginning, and I swear to you, you know, there was elements Maybe that we're not quite fine, that we get great advice from, from Vesa and his team. But right from the beginning, we left Arad and, and Arad told us, we will take you. We will launch you in October 2019. And when I think of that, you know, I must say it was something very special because it was four months before the pandemic. And, and it allowed it, Matière Première, to become alive. Uh, yeah. Thanks to thanks well, to thanks you, to Arad. You've worked with Vesa and the team. You know how dis, you know how discerning he is. Um, and trust me, I, there is a lot of perfumers that visit us and wish they got the same response from Vesa. <laughs> so he has great taste, but for sure, it's because what you presented was amazing, and um, for sure. And yeah, and and like I said, we're absolutely in love with Oud Seven. So long may it continue. Tell me. Um, Going back to perfumers, 
which perfumer do you admire most? A living perfumer today and why? Honestly, uh, there, there's not a single one where I can tell you. But when I think what I admire are creations. And there is not one perfumer mm. where I can say I love all his creation. But, you know, I am so admirative. I loved uh, L'Aude Bulgari, created by uh, Jean-Claude Elena. Uh, I loved um, L'Odyssée, created by Jacques Cavalier. <laughs> I loved uh, Lulu, created by my father. <laughs> yes. I was absolutely crazy um, also about, um, uh, I thought Aqua di Joe was a wonderful fragrance created by Alberto Morias. You know, and so there are. Do you, do you ever wish you'd created them? Of course, <laughs> of course. But you know, there are so many fragrances created by my uh, by my perfumers uh, friends, also, or and that I wish I w I could have created. You know, I think you know, uh, for her by Narciso Rodriguez was a, was a wonderful fragrance. Oh, yeah, fabulous. Fragrance created by. It was created by uh, Christine Nagel and Francis Curjean. You know, those are also two people that I'm very close to. Uh, so it's, uh, no, there are Amazing many. company. Many. Um, one of the questions I had actually, is quite, it's quite apt when you talk about a collaborative fragrance like that. One of the questions, I'm trying to find it, but somebody asked if you could choose two perfumers to create a fragrance with, who would they be? Who you haven't worked with before? I would say um, Germaine Cellier, mm -hmm. who was a perfumer from the 50s, mm -hmm. who was a, an incredible woman. So it was really someone. It who, was unusual then, right? Yes. Okay. I, I don't know if it was so unusual, but okay. you know, certainly I think what is unusual is to have so much talent. <laughs> and uh, so that's, what, that's one person. And uh, if I could, I would say my father. That's nice. <laughs> That's so nice. We we would all love that. We would have all loved that for sure. For but, sure. But, 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 you, but you know, also the reason why I'm telling those two people is also because, you know, I've worked 14 years at Givaudan. So I've been lucky enough to work with almost every perfumer at Givaudan. Yeah, well. I, I worked uh, five years uh, at, uh, at Firminich. So Sam, I worked with most of the perfumers that are there. So I'm, I'm a lucky person because, you know, I already got to work with, with, with many people and, and sometimes you win projects, sometimes you don't, but what matters is really, you know, the experience to, to leave that together. Yeah, very nice. Um, and another question we had, they're brilliant questions, I have to say, and they're coming in thick and fast, is which is your favorite creation of your creation? Or is that like children? You really can't have a favorite. Yes, that's what every perfumer say. <laughs> it uh, is. I don't know. Uh, I don't. It's difficult to say. I, I'm very proud, I must say, of Radical Rose by Matière Première. For okay. one reason, it's because this perfume has been created with my own roses. Yeah. That, you know, that took me maybe four years to grow. You know, we have an amazing field. There's, you know, almost like, 15,000 plants of rose. So it's, it, to me, it was really a dream come true to be able to be in May in the south of France with the pickers, pick up the flowers, drive it to the factory, get the absolute in September, compose your fragrance during six months and launch Radical Rose with those flowers. That I mean, to me is dreams. really, yeah. yes. And it's really something that it's close to the philosophy that I have of this work is, okay, you can't produce every single ingredient, but I think we, we make this beautiful work, this beautiful job, and it needs to make sense. We don't just do formulation. You know, we need to be in contact with ingredients. We need to be in contact with people who buy perfumes. We need to understand who we recre recreate for, you know, and to me, Radical Rose, um, you know, was actually, I think, something very special for, for me. Well, trust me, I've been seeing some of the chat this evening and you have a, a plethora of huge Radical Rose fans um, with us. And yeah, I'm definitely one as well. It's an outstanding fragrance, it's something you and, should be very proud of. And, and you know, and that it, it's outstanding, but there's two reasons why I think it's outstanding. It's the quality of, of the rose, 
It's also the fact that it's, it has the largest amount ever of rose centifolia from grass in a bottle. You know, so, and that's really is also something I'm very proud of is, you know, our fragrances, the color of the fragrances are given by the ingredients. Mm -hmm. So we put a lot and we think simplicity, I think simplicity is a, as something extremely sophisticated. And we, we, you know, simplicity is a ultimate sophistication. And I really feel that Radical Rose, you know, embodies that. I agree, very much agree. We've talked a lot about all of your work in perfumery, but, and, and I guess you started in economics. Um, I'm sure now you have your whole, your own house. These two things come quite nicely together um, at times. But if you weren't in perfumery, what area would you work in? Um, so ju just to, to know what, what, what you said, you know, nowadays I do nothing with economics. I'm very lucky because I have two associates, <laughs> Caius Vantnering and Cédric Mepré. Who, who, who deal with that. And my two associates that I build Matière Première with are people that I met when I was creating perfumes. Caius was one of my clients. He was actually a head of a fragrance house, oh. uh, a head of, um, of Valentino and Nina Ricci and before Kenzo. And, and Cédric was working with me at, at Givaudan. And there's something that really linked us was the fact that we, created, we were creating fragrances together. And that was really was to, uh, to, to us the fun part. And that's why we wanted to create Matière Première, to recreate those moments of creation, of common creation. Uh, and so if I wouldn't be, to answer your question, if I wouldn't be a perfumer, I think I would love to be a painter. So I would be a bad painter. That's what uh, I would say. <laughs> I think uh, well, I would if be you a... have your mother's talents, probably not, right? <laughs> you probably would be a very good painter. I imagine myself being, a, you know, a painter in the in the south of France, you know, not being rushed, you know, working on a slow motion. No deadlines. <laughs> no deadlines. Drinking tea and coffee all day and painting a little bit. That's. Yeah. that's it, it sounds heavenly. Take me there. I'm I'm a <laughs> dreadful painter, but I could see myself doing that too. It does sound heavenly. A lot of and um, we talk we talk and we really I suppose celebrate scent memory um, through the Fragrance Foundation. We think it's a an, you know it's a very important link to to you know scent and emotion. So. Aurelien, what is your scent memory? <laughs> what is your ultimate scent memory? Well, I, I have a few. So the, the ones that I remember from my childhood are, I remember, you know, when you're a little kid, when you're five or six years old, you're about one meter, one meter ten, <laughs> and your nose just reached the level of the adult's hands. And I remember the smell of, um, of my mother, who was a sculptress in marble, and her, her, her hands were covered of, uh, of marble dust, and also the smell of cigarettes. She's, she wow. smoked cigarettes. So that, that, that is a memory that is really profound to me. I also remember the smell of my father coming back from what he was calling the factory, but it was actually a perfume house, and he was really smelling different fragrance on his hands, on his arms, and I remember that. But one more precise memory that I have is in the south of France, in August, my grandparents and my grandfather was, you know, they were growing jasmine. And every pickers come at seven in the morning to pick the flowers. And at the end of, uh, of the morning, by 11, 12, they all gathered together. And my grandfather used to bring them all in a little house uh, next to the fields, a little, what we, little farmhouse. And inside this house, they would compound the amount of flowers they have picked. And it was all a very ceremonial moment. You know, he was like uh, writing down how many kilos each pickers or how many grams each pickers had picked. And everyone was queuing to, 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 to compound their flowers. And there was a mix of smell of the jasmine, the clay on the ground, and the petrol from the different uh, wow. agricultural machine. And the mix of it, the mix of that smell is incredible. And our days, 40 years later, or maybe 35 years later, when I go back 
to this same little house, I can still smell this odor. Yeah, that's amazing. I love that. How fabulous. Crazy how, how little things can continue with you for the whole of your life. And may I ask you, why do you think organizations like ours, the Fragrance Foundation, are important? In our industry? I think they are, they, they are so important for one main reason is to share and to make people understand uh, the beauty of fragrances. Uh, I think, you know, people who sell perfumes are so important. People who talk about perfumes are so important because it's about, you know, of course we create fragrances, but we need people to relay the message, to make people appreciate perfumes. We, you know, when we created Matière Première, I was surrounded by people and friends who were working in fashion, in art, and they were all very proud to tell me they were not wearing any fragrances. And they were, you know, I think people with great taste, and they were mm -hmm. saying, you know, they were thinking it was cool not to wear a fragrance. Mm -hmm. And I think that's why we need organizations like the Fragrance Foundation to promote fragrance. I think when fragrances are well-made, when they are not necessarily sweet and sugary, and when they are unique, when they are pleasant to wear, then people can appreciate. And mm -hmm. it's a real challenge of today to give people some interest in fragrance and to make sure they spend also some money in buying fragrances and not just on, on, on phone, on iPhones and, 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 and others. So I think, yes, we need to, to make fragrance cool. Yeah, agreed. And tell me what excites you about the industry today? I think what excites me is people who try to create new things, different things. I, I, I meet and I see different people from fashion house, from fragrance house, who really have great ideas. And this is the beauty of creating perfume is to create with people. And there are people with great ideas, with great new projects, with things that, are, that stands out. Uh, that's one thing. And I think one extremely inspiring thing is also the fact that increasingly people are becoming extremely conscious about the planet, about nature, yeah. and about promoting a certain, a certain way of creating perfumes. So of course, not everyone can do the same. Not everyone can, can create uh, in the same way with the same, um, with the same uh, I would say, philosophy but i feel like everybody is trying and and that's a good start even though we need to do much more <laughs> yeah exactly and and how do you think we can do more just by by trying by understanding i think first by teaching people and explaining you know uh, that's i think that's one key things and that's one of the role of the fragrance foundation uk but also the right. fragrance foundation around the world mm -hmm. promoting and explaining and that's also a role that i think perfumers have and the fact that we 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 work with people who are ethic who are caring with local population who you know we, we can't grow ingredients locally all the time but we can work with people who are very conscious who are careful and who try their best. And that I think is one first main thing. Yeah, we have choices, right? So definitely the direction. You're clearly a very busy man, <laughs> achieving so much. I think I'd love to end just by simply asking you, how do you relax? <laughs> <laughs> I feel, you know, my when I, when I say that with my, with my father and we speak about that, we don't, he, he laughs and he said, you know, you just take a blotter and pretend you smell it, and that's relaxing. <laughs> <laughs> so, you know, it's... Yeah, never, never, never moving too far away from the day job, for sure. <laughs> we, um, here at the Fragrance Foundation, we couldn't be more thrilled that you are a finalist in two Fragrance Foundation Awards 2021. So you have been nominated in, and a finalist in two, one for the ever popular Radical Rose, um, which has been nominated in the Independent and Perfume Extraordinaire category, and also for Best Newcomer for Metier Premier. So we, Mattia Premier, apologies. So we, we wish you so much luck. Um, I'm sure everybody here with us this evening sends you lots of luck as well. And we only have to wait a few weeks now um, before the <laughs> Fragrance Foundation Awards to see if you're a winner or not. 
I know of one lady that probably knows already, but trust me, she's not giving anything away. I know nothing. She, Linda, maybe. <laughs> I know um, nothing either. <laughs> Uh, I think I'd like to, to add to that, Arlian. You know, the fact that you are a finalist in these two categories. Um, so we, you know, twice with Radical Rose, and then obviously with, with your your own house is is such an achievement because we individually we had seven hundred and fifty nine entries. So it you know it's to to be a finalist is really something so special and um and i think what that's what i love about this industry i'd love to hear what you say is that you know as an industry i think we really all do come together we are really supportive of each other as you were saying about your friends that are perfumers but i think with brands you know they're always um on the night of the awards um brands will go and congrats uh, congratulate their competition if you like and just say i wish that had been mine which is something you said earlier actually about i wish i had created some other fragrances <laughs> that, that I, I really admire by other perfumers so um yeah um we wish you all the very best of luck um uh, it's actually only now eight weeks away so we're nearly there it'll be on thursday the 30th of september so hope we will see you there because well, we, we, you, you know linda we are so grateful because we are extremely honored to be part of this selection whatever the outcome is and i say that very honestly because you know when you start uh, and many people who have their own fragrance house know that but when you start you are amazed to see that you get some recognitions from people you don't know and that's one of the most amazing thing with perfume is to to smell people liking your perfumes yeah. uh, or wearing your perfume and you don't know them and so we are to me and to the old matière première team you know matière première means raw material mm -hmm. but we are so thankful uh, for that because somehow it means that what we are trying to do people understand that we are trying to do it well and yeah. and it, we really appreciate that people in in the uk actually uh, like matière première and radical oil especially well, we're delighted so you, you joined as a member and thank you for all your support um, when we did our insta live with you back in may that was just phenomenal to actually talk to you actually in the rose fields, picking those roses. Um, it was like you could smell them. So I am coming next <laughs> May. <laughs> I'm going to you. Are, you. Are you <laughs> yeah, no, I definitely am. Um, but it really remains for me to just say, well, first of all, a huge thank you to everybody that's tuned in this evening. You have so many fans. You must know that already, but we can obviously see all the comments and everything that's coming up. So thank you to everybody for sending those through to us. And um, a huge thank you to Annalise for, for talking to you tonight in her busy schedule there. Um, I, get the, I get the easy job, Linda, but thank yeah. you. <laughs> she particularly requested that she, she could talk I did. to you tonight. <laughs> I did. Um, and, and to you, Arlian, and to, to your team for helping put this together this evening. It's been an absolute pleasure and a delight, and I cannot wait to meet you in person. So I want to wish everybody a really lovely evening. Um, yeah, it's wine o'clock here. It's a nice glass of wine now, I think, for us. And um, thank you again. Thank you.